you will hear a buzz. Hi, my name is Gabe Newell, and welcome to Portal 2. When we released the original Portal in 2007, it was an experiment to see how gamers would respond to a different kind of gameplay and storytelling experience. Portal went on to win a bunch of awards, sell many copies, and, most importantly, resonate with gamers in a way that no other Valve title has. The challenges for us in building Portal 2 were to live up to people's expectations, to take you back to the world of Chell and Aperture Science, and to surprise gamers again, not with more of the same, but with more of the new. And I think it will be, mostly, a pleasant surprise. To listen to a commentary node, put your crosshair over the floating commentary symbol and press your use key. To stop a commentary node, put your crosshair over the rotating node and press the use key again. Some commentary nodes may take control of the game in order to show something to you. In these cases, simply press your use key again to stop the commentary. Please let me know what you think after you've had a chance to play Portal 2. I can be reached at G-A-B-E-N at ValveSoftware.com I get about 10,000 emails each time we release a game, and while I can't respond to all of them, I do read all of them. Thanks, and have fun. The writers went back and forth over whether or not Wheatley had tried escaping with other tests. The idea of being stuck forever in a state of stasis that looked like a crappy old motel room had been in our minds for There's a long a time, but we weren't sure exactly how we wanted to rip you out of it. There was some debate over whether the opening sequence happened inside the player's head or not. There was an alternate opening where Aperture had hooked up all of its cryo-stored test subjects to an incredibly boring hotel room simulator, which Wheatley would then wake the player from. Eventually, this was discarded as too difficult to explain in the short time allotted, and we opted to change the hotel room to a container ride on a rail. This allowed us to show the player, rather than tell them about how they and other test subjects have been stored, show some of the scale of the facility, and even hint at how much time has passed. We also get to gradually reveal all of this through the destruction of the container itself as it moves and bangs into things. Overall, this gives the player a much more dynamic and visceral introduction to Portal 2. The writers went back and forth over whether or not Wheatley had tried escaping with other test subjects before waking the player up. It was an interesting idea, and you can still hear remnants of the story arc in some of the dialogue. But at the end of the day, it was just too expansive a concept to sell. So it's hinted at, but not overtly mentioned until the end. The container ride destruction sequence provided some now, unique technical challenges. The dynamics you experience are actually computed as two separate but nested simulations. But, um, the first is a core scale simulation designed as a stress um, element analysis um, pass. Just do your best this pass computes the, the overall head. gross motion of the container itself and computes the collisions and breakpoints based on path keyframe data and a network of constraints. Right. Off you go. As the container bumps and crashes along, the constraints start breaking and the room progressively starts to come apart. There are over 300 rigid bodies and 900 constraints in this rig, yeah. all individually configured for properties like tensile, oh. friction, and, and collision again, response. The, the core simulation event. portrayed gross motion that we captured the main dynamics of the ride, but not the fine details. The product of the core simulation was then used to deform spline-based surfaces representing the container geometry, which in turn were parents to fine debris anchored as rigid bodies. As the surface deformations increase, anchors are broken and the fine debris rigid bodies are released into the simulation. The fine simulation also includes the interior furniture and the model detailing. The two simulations were then connected using cache data and were driven together by a series of scripts. Due to the computational complexities of having two nested simulations, we had to come up with some solutions to some interesting mathematical problems. One problem was that the nested nature of the simulations resulted in some instability in the fine debris calculations due to floating point computational limits. The solution employed for this was to compute the fine debris on a stage where the root transform of the course simulation was essentially cancelled out and stored for later use. This allowed us to more accurately detect the fine interactions between the debris and the environment. Post-simulation, the root transform position and inertia were reapplied to the details. We solved the problem of trying to compute the player within this highly dynamic environment by putting them in a virtual room that has all the base shapes of the rendered container, but is simply used to compute player navigation. It's hidden somewhere else in the map. 
The viewpoint of the player is then parented to the course simulation transform, resulting in the final rendered frame. At the end of the ride, the player is teleported into the actual game space. The simulations were iterative, enabling us to sculpt the dynamics in parallel with gameplay design. In the final product there are over 1200 rigid bodies, 900 constraints and 1000 joints. With all the iterations combined, the actual runtime spent computing the simulation was 92.4875 days. This room is meant to teach players the fundamentals of portals, connecting them to two places in the world. As the blue portal moves around the world, the orange stays rooted. In the original portal, this room had these portals moving by themselves on a timer. This led to most people simply staring through their orange portal, waiting for the blue one to end up in the right place. We felt that altering this to make the players decide where the portals came out was more instructive, and meant that players who already knew how to use portals could solve this puzzle both quickly and with authority. This map was one of the first of the older portal maps that we beat up and decayed to bind the two games together. The smooth jazz joke is probably the oldest one in the game. The team discovered through playtesting that smooth jazz was funny to all ages, genders, and cultures. Much of the fun in Portal is based on the joy of the aha moment when you learn something new. The game needs a very specific pacing to ensure these moments. If things are too easy, then you're robbed of that moment since it feels like you didn't accomplish anything. If it's too hard, then players feel stupid instead of smart when they finally realize that one small part of the puzzle that they were missing. Unfortunately, trying to create that delicate balance leads to a lot of shuffling of levels and a lot of revisions and tweaks to existing levels. When we started the project, making any big structural change in a level or the order of levels would lead to hours or even days of busy work, trying to reconnect things and make sure they lined up again. If we ever wanted to ship something the size of Portal, with the finely tuned balance we desired, then we needed a way to be able to make the big changes to the layout of the game without paying the cost of making everything line up again. We needed a way to bend space. We needed to think with portals. Using portals to connect different areas in the world, we could make any type of impossible space work out. You could look through a hallway into the next room, but the hallway might be on the other side of the map, and the room you were looking into might be in a completely different orientation. We could seamlessly insert an elevator, a huge expansive vista, a room that was bigger on the inside than the outside, or even create an infinite fall by connecting a shaft back into itself. Soon every connection between any space was a portal. We could even switch them on the fly. Even a simple door worked like the cartoons, just a facade painted on a wall that seamlessly opened somewhere else entirely. Once the game settled down, we were able to finalize our path and remove all the world portals. There's only one impossible space left in the whole game. See if you can figure out where it is. Come on through! This interaction with Wheatley was the first that we hooked up for our initial showing at E3. It demonstrated how Wheatley would be an actor in the world and how the player would not only be interacting with him directly, but also using him to interact with the Aperture facility. The Wheatley model was designed as a mechanical version of the original Portal 1 personality sphere. Originally, they filled a very similar role to that in Portal 1, so we needed one base model which could hold a lot of different expressions. Experimenting with different rigging ideas, we came up with the onion skin design, where a number of spherical plates could slide around inside each other, all supported on a small motion platform mounted on a gyroscope. This meant that no matter what expression Wheatley was pulling, he always retained his spherical shape. The modelers and the animators collaborated closely on these early tests to make sure the design supported the range of expression needed to satisfy any personality sphere that got designed. Lots of ideas were thrown out, such as a small internal robot arm that Wheatley could pull out of one of his ports and pull himself around with. We were careful to make the mechanics look plausible, but we had to cheat the eyelids, since they ended up being a physical impossibility. There was no way all that geometry could fit into the space around his eye without clipping out the other side but they were such an essential feature of the model that we resorted to crushing them up inside the eye where the player can't see them. Rail to tell us where to go. Oh, this is How do you make a giant mechanical eyeball express life and emotions, let alone give the impression that he's talking when he has no mouth? The animator's understanding of human behavior came in handy for bringing Wheatley the personality sphere to life. Talking is so much more than just moving a character's mouth. You have to use body language, head attitudes, and rhythm of movement and eye focus to indicate a character's feelings and motivations. 
Slow, smooth head moves, a steady gaze, and a relaxed eye aperture indicate that Wheatley is calm. Short, sharp head turns, rapid blinks, and glancing around indicate nervousness or deceit. Add a tightly constricted eye aperture and a little shiver to show fear. Tilting the body away while keeping the eye focused on the player signals an attempt at cleverness that ultimately only fools Wheatley himself. Suspicion is communicated by squinting his eyelids and handles, which function as very expressive eyebrows and cheeks. It's also fun to remind the player that Wheatley is a machine. When hacking, his eye and body segments become perfectly centered and spin mechanically, inspired by the spinning tape reels on old Univac computers. And when he wants to look far in front, he flips his eye all the way over to the other side of his head. This animation approach, combined with the writing and vocals, makes Wheatley quite a unique and entertaining character. Part human, part machine, all eye and no brain. She is. Originally, Gladys was built to curl up and disguise herself as one of her rings, potentially explaining how she had survived the explosion at the end of Portal 1. But this wasn't a very dramatic reveal, so we threw it out in favor of spreading her out over a greater distance. This also made her more recognizable as GLaDOS when you initially crossed the room. The actual wake-up animation was a combination of simulated animation with a layer of hand-keyed animation over the top. A two-stage model was created for this scene. The first stage had separate pieces and connecting cables that would be drawn together by running a physics simulation so that the pieces would interact with the environment. Physics simulations were also used to break apart the objects GLaDOS crashed into while she rides around. At the point where GLaDOS rises free of contact with the ground, she switches instantaneously to a fully connected model with controls for hand-keyed animation. From this point, the animator enhanced GLaDOS's awakening by hand, choreographing the violent chaos of her re-emerging consciousness while at the same time conveying the weight of a machine the size of an airliner. Once the hand-keyed animation was done, a final simulation pass was run to animate the cables and dangling parts of GLaDOS's body. The scene was produced very rapidly for an E3 deadline, and a traditional rig for the sequence was never fully realized. This made it difficult when we extended the sequence after E3 to add further animation, but we accomplished it by bearing in mind that GLaDOS herself is pretty broken at this point. The last part of the sequence requires the player to lose control of their view while being immobilized by a giant mechanical pincher. Once the controlled camera takes over, a careful alignment and time synchronization was required to make all the hand-animated models and camera interact with each other. Each of the stages in this wake-up scene contain a variety of processes that are very challenging to achieve live in a game engine. Still more years to do it. More. When the player first encounters the robot arms, we wanted to convey that they were still coming back online. The idea was that GLaDOS was just waking up and hadn't yet fully regained control of them. Slowly over the course of the first few levels of this act, she gets more sure of herself and her ability to alter and mess with the lab increases. The arms presented a number of challenges, the key one being the interaction with the player. It was easy for the player to get stuck behind or inside of the models if they did something too complex. So we had to limit most of the arm action to the walls or ceilings of the test chambers and we restricted their use on a larger scale to areas where we could be sure of the player's location. 